Uh, first of all, we want to thank everyone for coming today to our information session regarding the CTSI Research Scholar Program. Uh, we briefly uh, appreciated it if everyone could just introduce themselves and where they're at. Uh, and our program today will consist of some information about the application process and being a research scholar. But hopefully the second half, you'll get to meet uh, uh, so several research scholars, including Dr. Bardis, who's with us. And then of course, we'll have time for your questions and we appreciate your time today. I'm Joan Lukoski. I'm director of the WVCTSI uh, programs for investigator development and co-director of the professional development core. Carrie? Hi guys, I my name is Carrie Sisk. I am the assistant director of professional development with CTSI. And so I will be one of the ones um, leading this new cohort of research scholars. I am new to CTSI. I started October 31st. So um, I, I re I'm really looking forward to getting to know everybody and being part of this process of, of, of the research scholars. Great, Jody. Yes, hi everybody. I am Jody Saunders and I am the professional development coordinator here at WVCTSI. Great. And again, if anyone runs into technical problems, please reach out to Jody. Dr. Raven, could you just briefly tell us who you are and where you're located? Sure. I'm Dr. Marnie Raven and I'm in the WVU School of Nursing. Great. Super. Welcome. Uh, Josh Taylor. Hello, I'm Josh. I am a uh, the new pilot grant coordinator for WVCTSI. I uh, just started on Monday, so I'm still getting my feet wet and really getting in, but looking forward to working with you all and hopefully getting you some to help you out with the grants. Super. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sabina Nugutabab, if I pronounced it correctly, I apologize. I'm Sabina Nugutabab, and um, I'm a faculty member in the School of Pharmacy. I have joint appointments with the Cancer Institute. Super, thank you. Uh, Jess Thayer, hi Jess. Hi, hi, yeah, my name's uh, Jess Thayer. I'm an assistant professor in the general medicine department. Great, good. Uh, Yun Hung Yu, Dr. Chu. Uh, you're on mute. You're, we, we can't. Hi, uh... I'm a grant writer with the Department of Ophthalmology. I'm not actually applying. I'm just here to get information to uh, trans, uh, you know, tell my colleagues at Ophthalmology about this opportunity. Great, thank you, Richard. Good, uh, Dr. Hugh. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm from Marshall University School of Medicine. I'm a research assistant professor at Department of Biomedical Science. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And let's see, uh, Jim Bardis, I know everyone's going to meet you in a little bit, but just a quick hello. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jim Bardis. I'm associate professor in the Department of Surgery, uh, prior uh, CTSI research scholar. Um, I wear a bunch of research hats around the university, and I work for the CTSI a little bit, as well as the clinical data liaison. Uh, so we have like detailed data uh, poll uh, questions. We may uh, get to meet each other and, and have a chat about that. Great. Thank you, Jim. And Dr. Samantha Mintz. Hello. Uh, mm -hmm. I am Samantha Mintz. I am a vascular surgeon at WVU in the HVI Heart and Vascular Institute. I am a former research scholar um, and uh, current KORD uh, focused on amputation prevention research uh, for patients with vascular disease. Great. And you? Um, all be able to hear from both Dr. Bardis and Dr. Mintz and ask questions of them because they've been through the research scholar process. So thank you. Good. Um, what we'd like to do on the next slide is just give you a little background on the goal of the research scholars program. And it's really pretty simple, straightforward, where it's really to support early stage investigators like yourselves with the support you need to develop and launch your research program. 
and the research program where you're able to be an independent investigator, ideally in a position to obtain some external funding for that independence. So the program itself will provide protected time for research, access to many resources offered by the CTSI, and include a real emphasis on mentorship. Next slide. Um, some of the types of activities that are included as a scholar are that our scholars are conducting some form of clinical and translational research as the principal investigator. That's really the, the core of the program. Uh, each of you would work closely with a team of mentors to achieve your research goals, but also continue to advance your academic career. Uh, we do have a requirement now for uh, during this time to develop and submit a uh, grant proposal for external support so that your research program can continue beyond the period of being a research scholar. And again, we have numerous tailored professional de development activities for our scholars to enhance uh, your professional and personal skills, both in research and leadership. And again, all of this is accomplished taking full advantage of the numerous resources of the WVCTSI, which are available across the state, okay? So on the next slide, I just show you, we have a really lovely history of past research scholars. The program began in 2012. And what we're very pleased with, and just as you can see in the lower left-hand corner, many of our most recent scholars uh, from our past cohort have actually been very successful in obtaining uh, NIH funding, whether a K award or a U01 or an R21. And again, all of these individuals you see listed have really uh, developed and flourished in their respective fields with numerous publications. And, and though they may have moved on, several of them from the university, um, they're really accomplishing what we hope the program would do, which is uh, really make them successful as researchers mm -hmm. and to go on to develop and be independent. And on the next slide, you'll see our current research scholars. Hopefully, one of them are, is joining us today from the group of five. Um, Dr. Maria Cherasova is faculty in the Department of Psychology. Bradley End is faculty in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Tyler Quinn is in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostats in the School of Public Health. David Scarisbrick is in behavioral med and psychiatry, and Casey Kidd is in the Department of Pediatrics. And Casey actually is our first graduate from this group because she received a K-23 award this fall. And so she's well on her way to being a very well-funded independent investigator. So I wanna turn things over to uh, Carrie for her to take you through some of the eligibility criteria and the application process. Carrie? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Joan. Um, again, I, I would encourage all, all of you, our, our purpose of showing you guys the list of previous research scholars is, you know, re reach out to them as well if you have have questions and to hopefully see a lot of successful names um, on 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 that list. Um, so, you know, our eligibility, I think is pretty, pretty straightforward and clear for every, everyone. Um, we, we are looking for those in any of our partner sites. So, you know, we, we do have um, those of you who are attending from Marshall as well as WVU or any of our other, um, you know, the WVU Beckley um, sites. So anybody in, you know, the, the West Virginia area who is classified as an assistant professor um, as an early, early stage investigator. 
Um, as, as you can see, we define an early stage investigator as somebody who has completed their res a research degree or postgraduate clinical training within the past, past 10 years, but they have not um, served as a PI for any you know NIH independent research award because that is as Joan had, had just reviewed that is one of our goals is to to help um, help you understand that the grant writing process and the research pro process and to to get you to to be a graduate just like um, Dr. Kidd. Um, we we will you know this this has been as I said this is my my first time um, leading the the research scholars cohort. But from my understanding of the history of the program, it is a fairly competitive as we usually get several applicants um, you know, for, for, for each each start starting cohort. Um, so you know it, it is a, a competitive process. We want to make sure that um, individuals are sort of are, you know part of the clinical or translational research um, and, and you know the clinical practice what will be pr prioritized. We do not have a, a a true like citizenship or U.S. resident um, requirement. However, we do want to just make note that um, if if a faculty um, is appointed to research scholars, that it is um, their responsibility for making sure that their visa requirements are met for for, for research standards. So, um, if you do have a faculty member who's interested, or you yourself are on a visa, that that really shouldn't be an issue. But we do want um, to to make make sure that that you're you're well aware of your primary responsibility, as we do not um, do any of the the coordination with the the visas as as long as you are, um, uh, you know, uh, meet all the other criteria of being an assistant professor. Um, some of the benefits, again, that, that Joan also just sort of briefly introduced is um, up to 50% protective time of salary support for career development and, and, and research. So part, one, you know, part of the primary goal of this program, as well as the CTSI um, Professional Development Core, is to provide um, mentoring opportunities, professional development opportunities, grant writing, you know, group opportunities. Communities. And, and so, you know, we, we, we will advocate for you in your departments um, to, to have that protective time to, to make sure that you can meet all the, the, the criteria and the expectations of learning how to be um, a, a great clinical re, you know, re researcher. Your, the research um, program also does provide funds for research and, and travel opportunities. So if you are interested in some of those, you know, professional development that may occur at, at different conferences, you can seek funding support for, for that. Um, helping with, you know, career planning. I, I know that that meeting, um, you know, fairly often, one of the, the, those goals is just to, to make sure, um, I, even in the, the just few, a handful of meetings that, that I have been part of in, in the past month, I know that Joan has all, always um, emphasized that, you know, we're here to support you guys even after after um, you know, you're, you're done with research scholars, and so to be thinking about your future, um, you know, what type of, of research um, are, are you know are, are you interested in the, the clinical practice and, and move, you know moving forward? You also then receive priority for a number of our services. So we offer editorial services um, that can help and will help with grant writing opportunities um, and a number you know data analytics. And so you these research scholars are do receive a, a priority for, for for that as well. Um, we also have another co-director who often, you know, is, is involved in this process. Um, Dr. Courtney D Courtney D DeVries DeVries I, DeVries. Am I saying that right? I apologize, Joan. Um, and, and so um, she she's another contact person. And I I know like if there's any questions about the the salary cap or things like that, um, we we can hopefully hopefully get some of those questions to you. Um, I am going to pause at, at the end and ask for, for any questions. But again, if there's anything that, um, you know, th as I'm going going through this, guys, please don't hesitate to um, raise your hand or put something in, in, in the chat. 
Um, so the process really is the application process is kind of a, a three a, a three layered um, you know process. We are asking you guys. We don't want. We, we want to encourage as many uh, of you who are interested and believe that you're going to have um, support from your department chairs to, um, to, to, to consider research scholars. So this first step is a fairly brief one. If you are interested, you know, please, please don't, don't let it um, be something that, that is going, you know, that you don't want to want to apply. Um, but the, it, it is a letter of intent, of intent um, one page maximum. We're asking, essentially for these three um, criteria to, to be listed. I would also like to um, you know, mention that I will be getting all of these documents um, posted on our webpage, hopefully in the next week. Um, I've been working on, on making some of the, the necessary updates to, to match the program changes as well as you know, name, name and title changes. But all of this, um, the, the letter of intent instructions are already available on our website, but additional um, content with the handbook and the, the full application um, will be available very, very soon. So, um, but letter of intent, do um, we're asking for it Tuesday, January January sixteenth, um, and uh, a, again just a, a one page document that's sort of you know making sure that you you have um, you 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 have support and that you you have a good good research um, program. I you know. A good research project in in mind. Um, one of the the go ahead, Joan. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say I want to emphasize that this is the point at which you need to be sure to have a discussion with your department chair, because um, I think for a basic scientists doing translational work, that's not too much of a challenge. Um, because with 50%, you can still get your teaching responsibilities covered. But it can be a challenge for certain clinical units where they're short-staffed. So again, I'd approach this with a, a positive outlook when you reach out to your chair. But also, um, it's an opportunity to put forward that you'd like to have more protected time to develop your research interests. So thanks, Carrie. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so a, again, an application process or for, for, for that letter of intent. Apologize. There we go. Um, soon after then by January 19th. So, so, you know, very, very quickly, we will, we will, you know, review these letter letters of intent to make sure that you, you have a very clear, you know, research goal in mind, as well as that support from your department. And then you will receive a, a letter um, inviting you to submit a full application. So this will be a, a very, very quick, you know, tur turnaround. And um, most most of the time, I, I believe most individuals are are asked and encouraged and invited to to submit that this full application. Um, so the the full application. Um, you know, process does include a lot more detail and, you know, in information asking for um, a cover letter, which will, will probably be a lot of what you had included in your letter of intent, um, an NIH bio sketch. And I know um, I, I asked this sort of Jonah, I guess I should have asked you, Joan, do we provide help if you, if they want review their bio sketches reviewed like we normally do or... Yeah, I was going to say at this point in time, it's not necessary. I think okay. everyone can handle that themselves. But again, the notification that you'll receive is on Friday the 19th. That's right. not when the applications due. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. This is just you by this date, you will receive um, the, the, the the notification and the the, the invite. Um, so letters of support, your a, a very clear, you know, training and mentoring, your research plan. And, and, and again, these are the things that there is, there will be a document that will be provided um, with, with, you know, PDF of, of an outline of, of all of these. And hopefully these will be made available um, very, very soon. I just wanted to make sure that, that we get everything edited um, before 
before we 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 share you know share all of that. Um, and then another you know obviously big part of this is looking at a budget. Um, so you know you you yourself can budget for things in your research project that you know that you're going to um, potentially need to be successful and. Um, you know, she, you know that 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 is um, provided as part of this this process. Um, some of the things that you will be expected, you know, I we we are going to advocate for you and, and make sure that you receive that um, you know fifty percent effort of of protected time to to research, but then. Um, you know that time really should be also dedicated and contributed um, to you know to the research project and, and the plan and the other activities. Um, we have monthly meetings of what we call works in progress, um, often called WIPs, a, a WIP session, so works in, in progress. And this is an opportunity for us to, um, us as sort of a CTSI group, as well as your mentor group and um, the, the cohort of research scholars should all plan on attending these. Um, and we, we just want updates, right? We wanna know how you're doing on your research, asking you, um, things like what are what are some challenges? I know that once again, one of the first whip sessions that I was able to attend, um, it was really it was a, a, a wonderful presentation, but also a conversation of you know this is this is a, a barrier that I'm running into with my research and um, the other research scholars as well as those those mentors and those of us in the room were were able to to offer some some I, I believe some helpful advice. Um, you know, in order to to help overcome some of those those barriers and challenges that the the researcher was what you know what what was having, um, we do have all of these. I should should know that all of these are typically offered both in person and a Zoom option. So um, obviously, those of you who are at our partner sites and wouldn't be able to make it to um, you know to Morgantown, um, but you know to to try to adhere to everyone's bit busy schedule, there there will be. Um, both uh, available options for these monthly um, meetings. We do ask that you, you know, meet regularly with your, your mentor group. We believe that that's a vital part of this program, as well as learning to be um, a, a great re, you know, researcher. And so um, we ask you sort of, you know, because this is a grant thing, we have to make sure that we're dotting all of our I's and crossing our T's. And so we do ask that, you know, you keep track of your, your meetings with mentors and we'll, um, there, there is a, a short reporting requirement, as you can see on the bottom, a quarterly progress report that that we will require and that is you know just for for um quarterly reporting things um you know to to us and, and so that we can provide that to um our, our external you know grant grant um individuals as well as our our, our tracking team um we want to help you all, you know, publish, and so you know, publication of these research findings. Um, we we will, you know, make sure to to provide any support, and we do ask that you um, cite the CTSI grant when you do have any publications. Um, but we want to celebrate those accomplishments, and hopefully, throughout the the time of of, of being a research, you know, scholar, we are able to um, help you, you know, with, with several several different um you know pub pu publications even if you're not a first author um but to, you know to to get the, those publications and to help help build your guys's cvs and um your your th those research opportunities we do offer grant writing groups those are are led by by our very own um Do dr lakrosky and um, I, I know that those are generally, I, I, we haven't settled on times or anything, but generally like like Tuesdays and Thursdays um, for, for a couple hours and um, she will thoroughly help you re review um, your, your grant writing opportunities and again, hopefully submit a and, and get a um, a, a successful one, like many of our other um, graduates and our very own, you know, Casey Kidd in this, you know, last um, last cohort has has all, all already 
are already received. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to press that just yet. Um, a number of other just networking um, meetings. You know, there's there will be a lot of opportunities to meet with our um, RPI, Dr. Sally Hodder, you know, as well as, as a number of, of our other um, re researchers within the, the CTSI and the, the you know, the, the other other areas that, that that we work with. And so you'll, um, you know, do, will be invited to, to many different different re research scholars, you know, meetings and opportunities, even if they're just um, networking opportunities. Um, the CTSI annual meeting, and, and I believe we have tentative dates that are towards the end of September, but um, participation in that annual meeting will also to be um, part, you know, part part of the the responsibility there. Um, lastly, again, you know, any any type of PR requests as well as those quarterly progress reports. You know, some of you just your your your, your typical standard, I believe, expectations of um, re receiving you know funding from fr fr from a grant and sort of your your commitment to to us as. Um, as a research scholar and your contribution to the CTSI. Um, so here is, like I said, a, a very, um, or the application process for the the, the next year um, is sort of sort of a, a threefold. That letter of, of intent to do um, January sixteenth, you will receive a very fast turnaround of a notification of you know please proceed. We would love to see your full application. You know you ha had met all the criteria of that very simple letter of intent um, process. Full applications are due March first. So, you know, you really do. And if you get, get started and, and you're interested in it, um, we're, 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 you know, hoping that, um, you know, that the March 1st due date is something that is very easily obtainable. Um, we will have, you know, study sections and peer reviewers who will ultimately be, <laughs> excuse me, be looking at all these applicants um, and, uh, uh, awards will be announced on April or April 1st um, and your appointment as a research scholar if chosen will be July 1st. Great. Well, Kiri, thank you for all that background information. And again, we'll have time for questions. Mm -hmm. So if you do have questions about the application process, uh, we're happy to address them. Um, we've invited uh, two of the past scholars and one of our current scholars uh, to join us today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Samantha Mink, who is also the recipient of a K-23 award, which she received uh, from her work as a research scholar. And she's gotten on to bigger and better mm -hmm. things and constantly is presenting across the nation her research. Uh, Dr. Bardis will be introducing himself, and uh, Jim has also uh, seems to have a professional development bent because in addition to his own research, he's also mentoring quite a few of the surgical residents and fellows. And then David Scarisbrick, who's setting up his computer, will be joining us in a few secs. David is a current research scholar. So what I'd like to do is let you hear from each of the scholars, and then we'll open this up for questions. And uh, Samantha, do you want to go first to maybe reflect on uh, what you enjoyed about the scholars program and maybe what you see as pros and if there are any cons? That'd be great. Sure. Um, you know, I think that the scholars program was incredibly important for my development as a researcher. I My personal regret is that I didn't get it the first time that I applied. <laughs> um, I really wish I had gotten it earlier because uh, it was just such a great, uh, it was a great program. Um, and especially those check-in sessions. And uh, one of the biggest things is it, it does give you uh, access to important resources in the CTSI. Um, as a research scholar, and you also have the opportunity to try out things that the CTSI is contemplating. So it's just a really great way to get engaged in research. Um, it's also extremely important for your extramural funding because 
it's, it seems like it's almost a requirement that you show that your institution has already identified you as someone worth training. Um, I think that's something that you can see like for a K award progression where you maybe start with a seed grant or a pilot grant, move on to a training like a research scholar, and then the next move is a K award. That makes a lot of sense logistically. So I think those are uh, my some of my biggest take homes. Um, I think for me, I I got my K pretty early into the scholars program, um, but I did get to stay um, with my group. So I still got to get all of the benefits from being a part of it. So that was really great. And Samantha, you're now appointed as an associate professor, correct? Correct. So congratulations. So. Thank you. Uh, Jim, uh, you were in the same cohort with Samantha, but your research interests are focused in a different direction. So I'd appreciate hearing your your thoughts on the Research Scholar Program, too. Sure. Thank, thanks, Joan. Um, so, of course. you know, my interests um, are a lot of um, a lot of interest in using AI and machine learning approaches um, to solve some clinical questions in rural trauma care, trying to overcome some disparities that we see. Um, the scholars program was great from a standpoint of, um, you know, getting to one meet and collaborate and sort of bounce ideas back and forth of a group of uh, peer scientists that are in that same point in their career. Everyone's trying to, you know, make the next leap, uh, you know, um, uh, solve some of the same problems together as you're starting to build your research programs. Um, I certainly enjoyed um, some of the inner access to the CTSI, getting to know the bioinformatics group very, very uh, closely, working working closely with them. And um, that's led to my eventual appointment with them, uh, you know, in a part-time uh, position there. Um, you know, having the uh, the grant writing group, I, I really found fantastic. Uh, one, and just the accountability of making me write uh, every couple of weeks and uh, push that forward. Um, and looking back on what my grant <clears throat> was, my application to that, uh, which I've continued to re revise into my K and now um, going after um, this R type funding that's for researchers that are shifting their research focus. So, um, but going back to that original version to what it is now, it is so much better having worked with this group and, you know, um, I had that opportunity. Um, you know, Wes Campbell from the bioinformatics group has, has looked through whole sections of my grant to help with some of the, the language there. Um, I was able to find some res uh, some resources and mentors through the CTSI as well that I don't think would have been as easy to find uh, when you're a trauma surgeon and you need a you know an AI mentor. Um, uh, it's hard to go knock on doors in the the lane uh, computer science department. So um, uh, through this group, I was able to find some people that were really, really helpful in, in that regard. So I mean, overall, it was a great experience having the time as well to do the research was uh, you know can't uh, can't overemphasize how useful that is. Uh, to really uh, get your research program up and running um, and be productive in the, in the early years of as faculty. Oh, thank you, Jim. And I was going to say, our third speaker today is also uh, uh, in the clinical practice world. Uh, David Scarisbrick is currently a research scholar. So um, he has the vantage point of being immersed in the requirements and the team mentoring. So David, we'd love to hear your reflections on how a program like the Research Scholars may be useful and pros and cons. Yeah, so I start. I, I didn't hear uh, Dr. Mink or Dr. Bards talk about their background, but I, I came from a definitely a clinical side of, of uh, research. Mm -hmm. and had done mostly small sample size studies, all that kind of jazz. Research Scholars has allowed me to blossom that previous research into something bigger and better and more likely to help multiple people in West Virginia. Uh, most of my research involves neuroimaging and neuropsychology, so using neuroimaging to relate, to, to look at different areas of atrophy and understand how people decline across time. Um, and I think that for me, of course, time, I think Dr. Barge has said is the, probably the most valuable aspect of it, but also access to people like Joan and then my, my primary mentor uh, have been tremendously helpful in how I grow my research portfolio and understand myself as a researcher, which I think is another important piece of this is learning about yourself and your approach to research and how to maximize your efficiency, all of things that I've learned while as a research scholar, even though you might not think that as I came in late. Uh, we've been having internet connectivity issues over here, so I apologize. Uh, and so, but I think time. No, David. Yeah. 
time and access to folks. I, I probably have never met anybody who is as knowledgeable about grants as Joan. So I've never even literally in my life been exposed to somebody like that. And so just that exposure to people that you could never have been exposed to before has been really valuable for me and growing my, my own research career. So. So I have one more question for the three of you to chew on for the group that's listening. Thinking back on when you, when you prepared your application as a research scholar, um, how did you figure out your team of mentors? Because mentorship and having a team of mentors is a core part of this uh, type of program. Jim, you wanna go first? Yeah, um, I think mine is probably one of the more unique ones because like going from trauma surgery and ICU care to AI, I, I had to raise a hand and ask for some help. Um, I had um, pre-COVID, there had been some, uh, I think CTSI put them on like the AI and HSC, um, um, uh, what's the networking events? And I had met uh, Brad Price in one of those. And then uh, beyond that, it was, I think I, maybe Joan, you and I were the ones that spoke to about finding like Dr. Ajaro and the, those people to help with. Um, beyond that, like, you know, your career mentors and your prior research mentors, whoever's been with you for a while is going to be part of that team as well. So my division chief has been my mentor since I was a medical student. Um, I've researched with her because you need someone that you have some existing track record with. Um, you know, I think uh, everyone has a biostatistician uh on their their panel at some point, whether you have that up front or if you get some help along the way to find someone, that's also going to be a CTSI resource. But um, that's sort of how mine came together. Great, thank you, Tim. Samantha, how about for you? How did your team come together? And you're still busy with your team as a case scholar too. Yeah, um, for me, it was a lot of cold calling when I arrived on campus in 2017. Um, I had made connections with a lot of my mentors early on um, based on my research interest. Um, and my stuff is really community engaged research, public health disparities, uh, those sort of things. So it lends very clearly to public health. And so all, my entire team is public health focused. Um, so, and again, I think lots of meetings, getting yourself out there talking to people, getting names, following up on names. Those are all really important. Um, Joan, when we met initially, was extremely key. Obviously, Joan is key. We all know this, right? Uh, <laughs> she's a very unique resource, I think, um, and we're very lucky to have her. Um, but really, that is part of your strategizing. And so when I first met with Joan, she gave me like a list of people and helped me understand like it's not just enough that they're good people they need to have expertise um and you know you start really planning like oh okay maybe i'll get a publication with one of them try to do something like that to show that we collaborate um there's all those sorts of things you can start just planning as soon as you start looking around and seeing and it's great to kind of see what their pub record is see if they're putting out a lot of stuff see if they're highlighting their mentees um like who's who's first authoring things who's you know all of that is important um so that's really for me that was a combination and it was you really you have to have a a content expert for everything that you're hoping to train and plan on. Um, I, again, from my previous training in other locations, still had relationships with faculty with things that I had done. And so that was, uh, you know, if WVU didn't have that expertise, I was able to kind of enhance with that. Well, thanks for sharing how that process evolves organically. So you really have to start with your goals and your interests and then look to see who can help. So David, what, what was your process in finding your mentorship team? And I'm sure things are still evolving. Correct. And so similar to Dr. Mink, I went to Joan early on and I said, how do I make a team of mentors? And she gave me some original advice about picking experts and everything that Dr. Mink just reviewed with you all. So I'm not going to go through that entire process, but uh, luckily, we had some imaging experts in the department, and so I reached out to the person I was most familiar with, and they became my primary mentor. But really, they were more focused on their type of research and how 
their research could approach my research. So I had to find other mentors who were interested in what I was actually doing, which is movement disorder research and not just neuroimaging research. And so over that time, I was able to accumulate people, Dr. Razai and Dr. Trapathy, folks who could come on and be world-renowned experts in movement disorders. And then another limitation of my own knowledge, and I think that's what I was using my mentors to fill in, was really grantsmanship. And so uh, James Mahoney got added to my team as a result of me having quite literally never filled out a grant before research scholars. And so uh, feeling very fortunate to have been accepted, of course, but simultaneously, then I'm growing my team over time and reaching out to other experts in neuroimaging, uh, Harvard and Penn and other places like that, trying to find folks who will also help mentor the next phase of my process, which is how do I expand this out to something uh, even better to help the people of West Virginia. And so I think mentorship is filling in those holes within your own knowledge also and knowing that you can't know everything and you have to have experts around. Oh, great wisdom, David, as always. Again, uh, none of us come into this process of being a research scholar, kind of having everything lined up. It's kind of a process that as you develop your letter of intent, you want to be thinking who or what kinds of individuals would make a strong mentoring team for you that also would be viewed as very positive by the reviewers of your application. And I'll disclose, you're free to come to chat with me or Carrie Sisk and, and Courtney DeVries. We're here to help you with your applications. I do not, I'll just close, I do not sit on and review the applications. I'll read them for sure, but I'm not part of the, the scoring process because that would be a conflict of interest if I was helping you in making the judgment on who's going to be selected. Um, hey, Joan, will you let me add something to that? Yeah, please, David. Um, as like an anecdote, is that Joan mm -hmm. was so amazing in that first meeting that I begged Joan to be on <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, oh, I can't, you'll, I'll be part of your research. But I was literally begging her to be part of it because it's such a valuable resource to your future. Well, and so I'm sorry for interrupting. That's okay. That's you, you're all of you are too nice. But what I was going to say, this is a time for you as you're preparing your letter of intent and thinking ahead to your application. Think a little selfishly. What do I need from? other individuals. I think all of you are as professionals in, in your training, whether it's basic science or clinical field, you're all used to kind of supporting other individuals to help them be successful. The research scholars program is, is really designed to turn that around. So you are the person who's getting a lot of support. Uh, we have had a, a, a research scholar from Marshall University before, so we're delighted to see uh, uh, our colleague here from Marshall today. And again, this program is also flexible in the sense that we work hard to try to customize the elements to meet your needs. So, for example, some of you may need support for implementing a clinical trial. And that's a whole set of skills that um, the CTSI is very strong in. Others of you may need support on the writing side. We can help there. But most of all, the goal of this program is ultimately to help each of you contribute to the research infrastructure in West Virginia and the nation and, and this is such a great opportunity for you to have some breathing space. Now, it does mean you have to, you know, start those steps of negotiating with your chair or supervisor to make sure that they understand you have a goal and your attention to your normal responsibilities will still be there, but there might be some reduction in effort. But it's worthwhile. And I will share with you our first research scholar who received a K award, which requires uh, at least 50% protected time that's for surgeon, was in the Department of Orthopedics. And so if departments like vascular surgery and orthopedics and 
emergency medicine and psychiatry can have a research scholar where they all have extensive clinical loads. It's your departments should be able to invest in you because, you know, you're only a research scholar for 24 months at the most. That's a short amount of time for you. But the return on that investment is that you you turn into a very successful uh, and desirable uh, colleague at the university. And it really strengthens your academic career progression. And again, uh, all three of the individuals you've met today are really, in their respective ways, uh, incredibly generous individuals, but also incredibly uh, powerful professionals, both intellectually and scientifically. And you all heard them talk about uh, addressing rural health. And that's, that's a theme song to keep in mind as you pull your ideas together. How might your role as a research scholar contribute to improving the health of West Virginia? Okay, with that, Carrie, anything else to think that we've missed? Okay. Uh, so first of all, what I'd like to do is, first of all, thank Samantha and Jim and David, but we wanna open the floor so you can ask them questions. 